What's up guys? Uh, today we are gonna talk about simple harmonic motion and the formula for Hooke's Law. Now this is all gonna be done on a horizontal spring. Okay, so we'll see later on, we're gonna be able to move that spring um, vertically. But for now, we are just going to talk about horizontal springs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a mass on a frictionless surface. And this mass is not going anywhere, it's just hanging out, it's not doing anything. But attached to it, is going to be a spring. Now a spring is a special type of string that can do two things. It can push and pull, where a string can just pull. And another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark the center of this mass as position zero. So we're gonna say X equals zero meters. And right now this system is equilibrium, nothing is happening. If I apply a force to this box and I pull it, this way. So now there's gonna be some force that's gonna be applied to this box. Now what's gonna happen is it's going to cause the spring to stretch, all right? And the thing that I wanna look at is, I'm gonna look at this distance from the equilibrium position all the way to here. That's gonna be a very, very important distance for us when we're solving for what's going on with this spring. Now, as this, as this applied force pulls on the spring, what does the spring need to do back against the applied force? Well, it's going to apply a force back against it. And I'm gonna call this force F sub S. This is the force that's gonna be supplied by a spring, and it's going to be a force that wants to pull the spring back to this equilibrium position. This is where the spring always wants to be. It always wants to be in this position A. Okay, but now this applied force has come along and made it stretch. Well, if I remove that applied force, what's gonna happen is that force that's gonna be pulling on the spring is gonna make this box accelerate this way. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a situation where the box ends up over here and the spring gets compressed. All right, now if we look at the center line once again from that equilibrium X, if I extend this down, now we can see that instead of an X this way, we have some X this way. And these are gonna be the variables that are gonna be important to us when we learn about equation like Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law says this, F of S equals minus K X. Now what this means is F of S is gonna be called the restoring force. And as a unit of Newtons, and pretty much it pulls the spring back to its normal position. So here we have a situation in B where we're stretched, and here we have a situation where the spring is gonna be compressed, okay? Now, we know that we have different types of springs, and we have some springs that are really, really soft and loose and not very strong, like the springs that are inside of your pens, your little clicky pens, and then we have some really, really big springs, like the shocks in our car and things like that. But we can't take the words, the qualitative data of it's really stiff or it's really strong and put it in to a formula. So what we did is we create this K and this is called the spring constant. It has a unit of newtons per meters and this is how stiff or strong a spring is. Okay, and it's very important that this K is different for every spring. When a spring is manufactured, it is given a K. Now the reason that this negative is here is because SFS always opposes what the spring is doing. So here's what I mean. When I pull the box this direction right here, the restoring force back to equilibrium says, I wanna go this way, opposite to FA. So the restoring force is negative. Where when the box is moving this way, compressing the spring, FS says, I wanna go this way back to equilibrium. Once again, opposite. So that's where that negative comes in. Now X is gonna be the distance stretched or compressed. Because it does not matter if I am stretched or compressed, this X will be applied and this is gonna be with a unit of meters always, okay? So let's take a look at a really, really simple example of how we can use Hooke's Law to solve for some sort of restoring force. I can say I have a 12 centimeter long spring with a K constant equal to 400 newtons per meter. 
how much force is required to stretch the spring to a length of 14 centimeters. Okay, so when we're solving, we're going to say that Fs equals minus Kx. We have Fs is going to be equal to minus 400 newtons per meter times 0 0.02 meters. Guys, this is very important. Number one in meters, please. Okay, I gave you that in centimeters. Also, it is not, this is not X, right? This is not how much we stretched or compressed. We started here with some X initial and we ended here with some X final. Therefore, X is going to be X final minus X initial. So 14 centimeters minus 12 centimeters is going to be equal to 2 centimeters or 0.02 meters. Super, super important. Now, when we see this, we see that we get an answer of minus 8 newtons. Now, that's F of S. So the applied force to stretch it has to be the opposite sign. So the answer for FA, the force applied to stretch it, is just going to be 8 newtons. Okay, now these examples right here, this pretty much is when the box is going to be held in one spot. Next, I want to start to look at what happens if I let that applied force go and let that box oscillate back and forth. So in, now we're going to talk about the box oscillating. All right, and oscillating is just going to be going back and forth. Once again, let me just draw this picture. We have this box here. This is going to be the equilibrium position. Then I'm going to pull it out to here. All right, and I'm going to give it a distance stretched of X. When I let that box go, it is going to move all the way down to here. That box is going to be compressed now, some distance X. But what we're going to see is the box, because this is frictionless, is going to continue to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's what we call an oscillation. And we say that from the furthest point compressed to the furthest part that's stretched, we're going to call this the range of oscillation. Okay, or the region of oscillation. You might see it range or region. And when this thing is oscillating back and forth, we are going to call X A. And that's going to be equal to amplitude. All right, and that's on both sides. And amplitude is the distance from the initial position all the way out to here. It is not the full range. So this right here from the middle out to here, this is also called A. So the range of oscillation is really 2A. All right, so that's, that's just going to be for vocabulary and when I start to ask you questions. But now there's a couple things that we need to be able to identify and understand. First and foremost, if I look at these three positions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this box here. I'm going to put all three boxes on this one location, on this one box diagram, because I want to show you a couple different things that we need to talk about. Okay, so I'm going, to label the, I'm going to label the amplitude, the distance that it's moving. Yes, that's also the distance stretching of S. I'm going to remove the spring so we don't have to get confusing. And I'm going to call this point L, this point M, and this point N. All right, so these are going to be just for references when I ask you a couple questions here that we need to understand. The first question I want to ask is, is FS constant as the box oscillates? during oscillation, and more importantly, why? Okay, so think about that for a second. So if you need to pause the video and think about that for a second, is F of S constant during this whole back and forth, and why? Here's the answer. The answer is no, it is not constant. And the reason is because F of S equals negative X, I mean negative K times X, and if this varies, right, as this thing moves this way, the distance stretched or compressed is going to change. If that varies, this must vary. That is the only explanation that you need. And that's very, very important. But even more important, which is going to lead to my next question, is at points L and points N, points L and N have the greatest fs why because x is the greatest so we have here on the diagram uh 
fs is max fs is max but here guys fs is equal to zero newtons why because at the equilibrium position x is zero so you need to know where fs is the max and where it is zero super important because i'm going to ask this next where is the maximum acceleration of the box is does l have a greater acceleration than m think about that for a second and a reason why the answer is the max is at l and n and there's no acceleration at point m once again we know that a is equal to f net over m and when this box is oscillating back and forth the only force acting on the box is the force s fs so that's the net force so if here is where fs is the max that's where a must be the max so here a is also the max a is the max but here a is equal to zero meters per second squared why because f is equal to zero that makes a equal to zero very very important and that can seem a little counterintuitive when we think about this where is velocity or speed the greatest well this is the turnaround point so even though a is its max here v is equal to zero meters per second v is equal to zero meters per second and right here v equals its max all right so on the end acceleration is its max but on the ends velocity is zero and why is it going the fastest here well because as this restoring force pulls back on this box and we get to this equilibrium position the instant it passes this equilibrium position the spring starts to push back on it this way slowing it down till it gets to here just like when a pendulum swings right when a pendulum gets to here the instant after here gravity slows it down right gravity does work on the pendulum to slow it down at after the bottom point the same way here when i get to quote the bottom point or the equilibrium point right now the spring is going to be pushing back with the restoring force this way slowing it down that's why the speed is the greatest here now what does speed tell us that might be helpful well we look at four speed gives us relationship to kinetic energy so where v is the greatest so is the ke and this ke is going to lead to the energy part of this whole system we'll wrap that up before we start to do some examples let's once again look at what we have going on here so let me just draw lmn again and list those things that we know here we know fs is max here we know fs is zero and fs is max okay and the fs's give us information about a a here needs to be max a here is going to be zero and a here is going to be the max but the velocity at the turnaround points is going to be zero meters per second the v here is going to be the max and the v here is going to be zero meters per second okay as it goes between these two amplitudes now the v is going to tell us kinetic energy kinetic energy is going to be zero joules kinetic energy here is going to be the max and kinetic energy here is going to be equal to zero joules but now we have to understand if there is zero joules here so if ke initial equals zero joules and then it goes all the way to here and now ke is now greater than zero that means that there had to be a change in energy and there had that means there had to be work done but who's doing the work or what is doing work well the thing that's doing the work is the spring the spring is applying the force right because work equals a force times a displacement so work is making this thing go back and forth the force of this spring moving it a distance stretch or compress is doing work on the spring and it's converting energy from the spring into kinetic energy okay and we call this energy the potential energy stored in a spring and it's going to have a symbol of u sub s right if we remember before we had some fg 
which is mg. And then we had some potential energy due to gravity, which was mg delta y. That's our little review. So now we have an fs, and that's going to have a corresponding energy that's going to be uh, us. And we solve for that by saying 1 half kx squared. Same k constant, x squared. Please, as I always say, do not forget the squared. So essentially, when we have a large x, big x, that is gonna be a big potential energy. And this makes sense. This is the reason why when somebody stretches a rubber band or a spring really, really long, and then they ask you to hold it to your nose and tell you they're gonna let go, you don't want that because you know that that stretched spring or rubber band can do work on your face if that person lets it go. So where we have KE is zero here, the next and the final piece is gonna be, when I have a big X, that's gonna mean that US here is gonna be the max. And mu s here is gonna be zero joules. And over here, u s is going to be the max, okay? And in a frictionless environment with no outside non-conservative forces acting, right, we are going to be able to say that energy initial equals energy final, as we always did. And now, instead of the last thing we did when we said that u g plus k e is equal to UG plus KE. Now we can use information about US plus KE equals US after plus KE. And we'll expand that out to one half KX squared plus one half MV squared equals one half KX squared final plus one half MV final squared okay so this is going to be super important and this video is so long guys so i'm going to stop and then i'm going to open up another video and we are going to do examples using all three of those things we're going to use we're going to show examples using fs at max and mins where the acceleration is max and mins how we can use velocity to help solve for kinetic energy and how we are going to convert kinetic energy into spring potential energy, okay? So look out for that next video, guys. If you have any questions about this, just leave them down in the comments below. I'll catch you on the next one.